I started the Force Awakens video with a silly, I'll be objective and not a Star Wars fanboy disclaimer that was intentionally meant to be immediately dismissed. I'm not even going to bother this time. Some of you unsubbed when this hit your inbox, that's fine. But let's, let's do something real quick. Before we even get into this, let's take a poll. The Last Jedi. Love it or hate it? Just vote, pick one. Below that you'll see a second poll with some different options. This is one of those points that only works if things go my way. But number one, I'm really curious, and number two, I really need to know how many Russian hackers are in my audience for future reference. Just kidding, I know that there are people who genuinely don't like this movie. But you've clicked on this, so let's get into it. Another unique pan down from the heavens, Star Wars opening with this high-speed fly through the Resistance ships. No feelings were harmed in the making of this scene. What? You guys don't speak BB-8? Happy beach here, buddy, come on. I have an urgent communique for General Hugs. <laughs> General hugs. Took me to my third time to catch that one. You and your friends are doomed. We will wipe your filth from the galaxy. Donald Gleason is amazing and took the comedic tweet to his character in stride while still chewing the freaking scenery in a believable way. Just gotta get that out of the way. But I'm gonna be doing that thing that most of the other Last Jedi Defender videos say they won't do because, hey, I'm nothing if not thorough. You either think this is funny or, or you don't. Hi, I'm holding for General Hugs. But don't pretend like goofy slapstick humor, puns, and yo mama caliber comedy hasn't always been a part of Star Wars. I believe he's tooling with you, sir. About his mother. We're all fine here now, thank you. How are you? Boring conversation anyway. And besides, this is a fun sequence where his stall actually makes sense for whatever he's charging up to fly through there fast enough so the Dreadnought can't shoot him down. Underdog ships doing unexpected things to beat superior ships is kind of a motif. I like that they're sticking to Poe being the best of the best pilot. It actually plays into how arrogant he is when it comes to honoring command decisions. So this seems like a simple thing, but I gotta hit the easy ones. Why do the bombs fall towards the ship when gravity wouldn't be pulling them towards the ship? That's why. She breaks her back due to the artificial gravity on the ship. So once the bombs leave the ship, there's nothing to slow their momentum downward. Also, self-sacrifice from our first badass good girl in this film, showing no fear in the end. Supremely love. Comeuppance? Oh man, that's where Luke got shot in Return of the Jedi. Yikes, that's some continuity. This isn't a jab at fans who idolize lightsabers. This is Luke becoming the old hermit of this trilogy. He didn't get it then, he does now. Laser swords do not a Jedi make. Rey extending Anakin's lightsaber to Luke was a clear invitation. Please come save the day with this super special tool akin to fix it Felix's hammer. And Luke is letting her know he's not that guy. And for good reason as we'll get into. Where's on? First little hint that Luke has cut himself off from the force. Otherwise he'd know. You wonder why I keep a rabbit cur properly manipulated can be a sharp I'm gonna stay away from hypothesizing too much about Snoke, most of what he says can be interpreted in varying ways. I mean, who is he talking about? The context and timing sounds like Hux, he's addressing Kylo, but the actual words, rabid cur, that applies way more to Kylo. A cur is a low or mixed breed dog, which is exactly what Kylo is, and if anyone acts like they have rabies, it's Kylo. So is he talking to Kylo about Kylo? He's also a sharp tool who's been manipulated. My point is that Snoke is a crazy old fool, or he knows and controls more than he leads on. We may not have seen the last of him, or at least the effects of what he set in motion. Vader. Even the Imperial March responds to Vader's name, but not to be outdone, Kylo's theme overtakes it when he smashes his mask, symbolically letting go of his obsession with Vader, his first attempt to kill the past. Bested by a girl who had never held a lightsaber! A little lampshading for those who still complain about that battle. Even Snoke forgets he was shot in the abdomen with a bowcaster. <sighs> Remember those days when the biggest complaint about Star Wars was that Rey was too powerful? Those were the days. I think what? I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down the whole First Order? Spoilers! Also, love that he calls it a laser sword like his father when he was a kid, and also because that's his attitude. The legend of Luke Skywalker, and more importantly, as he'll explain in a bit, the Jedi has been way overblown. This is awful and gross. And is worth removing a win. But you get the point he's making, right? Ray wants Luke to legend up and he responds by spilling milk on his chin and going fishing. It's just another way of saying, I'm not the guy you're looking for, I just farm and fish now. But also that's some fishing ingenuity, making Tom Castaway Hanks look like a schlub. Who are you? Who are you? Mark may not have loved what they did with Luke, but that did not stop him from bringing his A-game. Just the two distinct deliveries of that question. Why are you here, Ray, from nowhere? The First Order's become unstoppable. Why are you here? There were heroes on that mission. Dead heroes. No leaders. There's Poe's arc setup. 
He starts this film right where he left off in The Force Awakens, a hero flying by the seat of his pants. But at this point, the Resistance needs leaders, not heroes. I know it's been a while since imagery like this hasn't been pretty commonplace, but these space battles are always so well done. The explosions being blocked by the shields, the familiar roar of TIE fighters, the tight corridors that the ships fly down. It just never gets old. Oof, Carrie, you're already missed. This moment between mother and son that's only conveyed on each actor's face. I don't know, it's a little goofy, I'll give you that. I also understand the physical limitations of a 60 year old woman on wires, but really, finally getting to see Leia have force powers that she should have had all along beyond force phone calls is worth a win. And you get that she's not flying, right? She's just force pulling herself back to the ship. And another thing I see missed is that this is an airlock. This door isn't opening to space. Right before force opening this door, I'm sure she force closed that one. Or two? R2. It is nice to see Luke light up a little seeing R2, even if for only a second. So stick to your post and follow my orders. The why didn't Holdo just tell Poe complaint is... It's not even nitpicky, it's just irritating. Why? Tell me why the leader needs to answer to one pilot. She owes him nothing, especially when they're being impossibly tracked, which would lead any rational person to believe there's a traitor on board. The one thing Holdo knows for sure about Poe is that he was dressed down by Leia and therefore she may no longer trust him. It's also possible that she didn't even have a fully formed plan at this point. Hey, that little burn from Kylo's saber in The Force Awakens got stitched up. Ha! <laughs> Stone Hut alarm clock. This relationship building narrative device is awesome and I can't believe people didn't like it. Ryan uses film language of shot reverse shot to tell you they're in the same space while only actually showing you they're in the same space the last time they do it. It's a phenomenal way of allowing these two to get to know each other. You're not doing this, the effort would kill you. Yeah, let's call it final solution shadowing. Can you see my surroundings? You're gonna pay for what you did. I can't see yours. So Adam Driver is amazing, but I love how he's more interested in the logistics of what's happening rather than how or why it's happening plays into his cocky attitude. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Honesty. <gasps> I feel something. You feel it? Yes, I feel it. That's the Force. Really? Wow, it must be really strong oh, of you. I've never thought force lessons. Peace. Violence. And between it all, balance. That Force does not belong to the Jedi. Man, that's like... Haven't I been saying that? I get that your appreciation of this explanation comes down to preference and your own interpretation. This is what I've always thought. There's this misconception that the Jedi are always the good guys, but every movie has given us at least one reason to doubt that, especially the prequels. I find this to be only second to Yoda's explanation in Empire. You went straight to the dark. I love how his astonishment that she went right to the dark initially gives him reason to be afraid, but ultimately informs his decision to return. But with the worst people in the galaxy. Great. Guys, it's just a joke. The worst people in the galaxy the first time were the smugglers in Moss Eisley. Now it's the capital residents from Hunger Games. And I don't really care how terrible they are. I want a convertible yacht space yacht and I'll do anything to get it. There's only one business in the galaxy that'll get you this rich. War. I'm not even sure how you could be offended by this in our galaxy since it's so clearly not true. War is profitable, but Bezos, Gates, and Zuckerberg don't sell weapons, man. Ironically, they sell something much worse. Material and immaterial happiness. Social commentary. Don't at me, I love Amazon. <laughs> BB-8 is acting lethargic because his belly is filled with gold coins. Say what you will about Canto Bite. I can't help but see it as just an expertly crafted thorough scene. I like this direct answer to why is Rey good with the lightsaber so quickly. She good with her staff. The legacy of the Jedi is failure. It's not true. At the height of their powers, they allowed Darth Sidious to rise, create the Empire, and wipe them out. And that's exactly why this is who a lot of us expected Luke to become. He's not even mentioning that the Jedi's teaching of emotion suppressing and fear of anything from the dark side played a big part in his dad becoming Darth Vader. The lighting in this film is astounding. That golden glow on each of their faces. I can break you into old man Snoke's boudoir. Benicio Del Toro is the man. Just the right amount of creepy mixed with cocky irreverence. Look, I'm not saying that if these creatures looked more like spiders with reptile skin, the sympathy factor may be lessened, but who's gonna deny horses with floppy bunny ears? <laughs> hey, that little drunk alien got his payday. Also sounds like he's related to the Joker. Well, if nothing else, I guess Rose got to... Put my fist through this whole lousy, beautiful town. And it's not without some fun first-person shots through the streets. Ha! Even the entry ramps are spiral staircases in Rich Town. Why did you hate your father? Do you have something, a cowl or something you could put on? <laughs> oh, meme win. But, come on, Adam Driver's workout routine. Being so wide that you're memed isn't a bad thing. Let the past die. 
kill it if you have to. Kylo says that, and then Rey immediately goes to the dark cave on the island to get answers about her past. His point is that it doesn't matter where you're from, just like it doesn't matter where he's from. Choose who you want to be. Beautiful sequence, but I also like that it's basically the same scene in Empire with a different meaning. Luke goes to the dark cave to confront Vader before he's ready, and in addition to probably being really confused, learns that to kill Vader is to kill himself, which makes more sense once we find out Vader is his father. Rey goes to find out who her parents are and is presented with only herself which is her first hint that she has no one but herself. For me, this is the most compelling part of this film. Two people teetering on the edge of the forest, dark and light, neither fully understanding their place in these ancient religions, reaching out to try to find commonality. It's some weird combination of familial, romantic, and I guess, force connection, but also somehow feels so relatable. Picking up where The Force Awakens left off, Ryan did as much practically as he could, even shots like the hut blowing apart were practical. Regardless of your feelings about who Luke has become, seeing him embrace being the master, fighting with an antenna, and knowing his superiority has to give you some sense of joy. Ooh, first time Luke has used the Force in a physical way in who knows how long, and it happens by instinct. I think this is where Ryan lost a lot of people, and I honestly understand your frustration. Luke should be better than this, but honestly, that's kind of what this film is about. It's why Luke is the way he is. He's not perfect, even our heroes have flaws. Last time he approached the dark side, it was because Vader had threatened Leia and Luke lashed out in anger, pleasing the Emperor. This time, he responded to his fear of what Ben would become. He knew where it led and wanted to stop it, but immediately regretted it. This is not going to go the way you think. Clairvoyance. Ooh, she once again extends his father's lightsaber to him, asking for his help, and Luke refuses because, like he said, what should he do? Face down the entire First Order? Interesting thing I'm just realizing is that Luke was totally on his way to burn the Jedi text when Rey arrived, which is why he changed right back out of these white robes when she got there. Makes even more sense why he'd throw the lightsaber away. He'd made up his mind about the Jedi already. Master Yoda. Young Skywalker. Puppet Yoda! <laughs> Yoda, always the trickster. Yes, failure, most of all. The greatest teacher. Failure is... Oh, man. Yoda talking about failure with notes of the piece that played during the X-Wing Swamp Retrieval after his There Is No Try speech when Luke had failed and given up way back then. Well done! <clears throat> That's what you brought us to? Coward! No, you are not just a coward, you are a traitor. What is it that makes him seem trustworthy? Not to mention, every time he asks, it's in public. So even if she trusts him, she has no clue if she can trust the rest of her bridge crew, especially given that some of them help with Poe's mutiny later. Vice Admiral Holdo, I am relieving you of your command. And then he mutinies. Is that when she should have said something? To the mutineer? I hear you, but he was obviously trying to do the right thing. Why in the crap would that be obvious to Holdo? You can't look at stories from only your omniscient perspective. She has no reason to tell him. And how about this? What if she tells him and he doesn't like the plan and then goes off and does something stupid like, I don't know, sending two people on a half thought out mission that ultimately leads to further destruction. Ha, <laughs> cause R2 looks like a trash can, so you get it. Just like to point out that whether Rey knows it or not, her clothes know the conflict inside her. She was wearing white during her last force meeting with Kylo. Welcome. Politeness. Scoundrel with a heart of gold. This is subversion done well. Just because he's an opportunist doesn't mean he's just a straight up jerk. I know where the nearest escape pods are. Of course you do. Ooh, traitor burn. She was more interested in protecting the light than she was seeming like a hero. I'm sure that seems like a third person humble brag, but think about it. The Light is the last remaining members of the Resistance, so keeping her plane a secret made her look like coward and a traitor to, well, I'd say some, but really it was just Poe. The Hero would have told everyone the plan and risked it getting back to the First Order, who, again, was tracking them in a way they couldn't explain. Fortunately, Poe set up Finn to let this stuttering opportunist tell the First Order the plan. We ran a decloaking scan, and sure enough, 30 Resistance... <laughs> what DJ did was just terrible, but that face... <laughs> Still that fiery spit of hope. Compliments. Kill this true enemy! Okay, you know I hate to brag, and I didn't get it exactly right, but I did sort of predict this scene that Kylo had to commit to his feelings in order to trick and defeat Snoke. More importantly, ha dang! Say what you will about some of the expectations of versions, this one is awesome. Who cares who Snoke was? Who was the Emperor? Just some powerful Sith. And Snoke's still half a powerful Supreme Leader. 
also yup to that shot. Oh man, the way her hand comes up so perfectly timed to the swelling score. Now we've got some Star Wars. Uh, I can't say for sure why the Praetorian Guards are still fighting after their leader is dead. I mean, Kylo would have to kill them either way. But this is a super awesome fight. Framed exquisitely with very little cutting, filled with awesome choreography and teamwork. It's so satisfying to see them fight together after the buildup in this movie. Ingenuity. Hey, finally those cross guards come in handy. Yep, a little reverse grip form that she had trained for earlier. <laughs> the very thing that probably should have happened to the original Ben when he handed Luke Anakin's lightsaber. Also this pork. We can rule together and bring a new order to the galaxy. Don't do this, Ben. I love her response as if he's reading words written in textbooks, which since it's been said so many times by so many baddies, it should be. But it's also the first time I genuinely thought our protagonist might actually join our antagonist because they have a real, actual relationship they've been building through this movie built on trust and common histories even though he's from all the bloodlines and she's from none. He actually cares for her and that's apparent. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. Call this a cop out. I'm glad Ray's not a Skywalker or a Kenobi or a Jin? Was that qui last name? And even if JJ does decide to give Rey a proper bloodline, it doesn't change the fact that she grew up with no one and nothing and had only herself. And just because the expectation subversion was nothing doesn't mean it meant nothing. It's the whole point. She's not from a bloodline. That's why her powers matter. The resistance crew is preparing to jump to light speed. It's empty. They're just trying to pull our attention away. For the record, I think that's the main reason she was able to do it. They could have blown her out of the sky if they didn't think she was just fleeing. <laughs> the executioners have a black stripe, kind of like a black hood. They burnt her hair. This is amazing. The silence, the visual, the destruction, the self-sacrifice. Ooh, and that bullet sound of the ship. BB-8 to the rescue. Reminds me of all the times R2 came to the rescue. Ha, <laughs> blaster beam just ricochets. Even if you think Phasma again goes out like a sucker, you have to admit this showdown is pretty fun. The Supreme Leader is dead. The Supreme Leader. Badass bad guy. Well, that's one of the prettiest shots in Star Wars. Also, obviously the Crystal Critters are a wife win. You'd be forgiven if you missed this, because it does happen fast. But the two TIE fighters aren't attacking the base, they're actually shooting at the stolen shuttle. That's why only Rose and Finn make it under the door. That was their goal, the TIE fighters were just trying to destroy them. Edgar Wright. And Gareth Edwards. Now this is pod racing? Nah, we've seen these high contrast images since the first trailer, but that doesn't take away from how beautiful it actually is. The aesthetic of the red underneath the white is wholly unique and stunning. I love the idea that the First Order learned from the Empire's mistakes on Hoth and beefed up the legs of their gorilla walkers so they can't be harpoon tripped. Triple kill! Chewie and Ray to the rescue! And the Falcon announced just by a familiar sound and shadow. At this point, Finn and Poe's arcs cross. Where Poe originally was the hero looking to do the deed no matter the cost, and Finn still didn't care about the resistance, just Rey, now Poe is starting to become a leader and Finn is willing to lay down his life for the resistance. Or, well, because he's rebel scum. That's how we're gonna win. Saving what we love. Okay, so first I'm taking a win away because that's what he was trying to do, flawed or not. Flying down the throat of that thing was his way of saving what he loved, the people in the base. So her line is sweet, and I get it, but don't accuse Finn of not getting that. But more importantly, there's just no reason to think that the slowly melting ship would have any impact on the battering ram that's specifically made to break things. Poe knew it, Rose, the girl who inspected the skim speeders, knew it. The only one that didn't get it was Finn. So she ended up saving him from wasting his life for nothing. No one's ever really gone. I'm really glad these two got a chance to be together on screen again one last time. You really can't create moments like this. Their legacy does it. Few moments, few pieces of music give me the rush and goosebumps that this moment does. The same melody is just repeated with increasing intensity. Everyone stares at Luke as if they're seeing a ghost or a legend, and he plays into the legend so perfectly. When the music finally crescendos, we get a badass good guy. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to believe he could force block a thousand laser missiles, but come on, force knowledge isn't invincibility. What's more important is that he embraced being a legend, but still so awesome either way. Bring me down to him. Don't get distracted, I'll go. 
Right away, sir. <laughs> Loyalty. He's doing this for a reason. He's stalling so we can escape. Of course, the guy who did this would realize that's what Luke is doing. Tell him Leia has an urgent message for him about his mother. No, no, we are the spark that'll light the fire that'll burn the First Order down. And then Poe fulfills his leadership arc and Leia even acknowledges it. Follow him. Luke's foot doesn't actually interact with the salt when Kylo's does. Yep. You can say, oh, but he's just a projection. Yeah, but Kylo's still not making contact. The resistance is dead. The war is over. And when I kill you, I will have killed the last Jedi. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. More honesty. And I will not be the last Jedi. And that's Luke realizing he still had things to learn, even about the Jedi. And that Rey's gray version of being a Jedi may actually have merit. And even if it's right before he goes, Luke's back! Hugging. Strike me down in anger and I'll always be with you. Ooh, a threat that cuts right to your soul. Actually, it's an emotional promise to Kylo that's a twist on Ben Kenobi's threat to Vader. And the deliberate skid of his feet as if drawing the blood he thinks he created with that stroke. See you around, kid. Badass good guy. In a few minutes, he channels both Obi-Wan and Han, bringing everything full circle. Whereas previous Star Wars films may have struggled with pained yells, let's say Rey and Kylo do not. One last moment of staring out at a double sun horizon is a very apropos send-off. But don't worry, this isn't the last we'll see Luke. Probably obvious, but no one who vanishes into the Force has ever gone forever. I like this little hint that it was more than just Snoke's bridge. More importantly, Rey shuts the door on her past when Kylo so clearly could not. I'm Poe. Rey. Well, now when Finn and Rey end up being brother and sister in the next movie, at least we have love interests for everyone. Luke is gone, but it wasn't sadness or pain, it was peace and purpose. Yeah, he coming back. Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master. We got a better storyteller than 3PO, but you get it? He's a legend again, because anyone may be a Jedi. I've wrestled for, well, almost a year now with how to deal with this movie. Truth be told, I started writing this script on December 16th, 2017, and have been adding, editing, deleting, tweaking, rewording, and otherwise just trying to get this right since then. I can't even tell you how many words I've written about this movie. Just kidding, it was a little over 14,000 at its peak. But a lot of that was because something would pop into my head and I'd just add it. I found out that a lot of the same ideas come to me worded slightly differently. A lot. It's under 10,000 now, but still not everyone will be interested in everything I have to say, so I put some timestamps in the description. 20% of you probably gave me a solid thumbs down within the first five seconds and left a hateful comment because you think I'm devaluing your opinion as a fan. That's unavoidable. That's not my goal, but I know some of you will still feel that way, so I'll just apologize in advance. I'm not arrogant or foolish enough to think I'm going to change anyone's opinion, and by all means, if you're here just hate watching this video, know that you're doing the right thing. I support you. I can let the hate flow through me and hopefully you get some catharsis out of it. I won't even say that you shouldn't hate it. It sucks that you feel Disney, Ryan, and Kathleen all ruined your favorite characters. And as much as controversy breeds views, I'm not here to stoke the fire of that particular war. Even if I don't understand or agree with your issues, you're allowed to have your opinions and you can feel as betrayed as you do. It was a cheap move. What you're not allowed to do is attack other humans over a dumb movie. Unfortunately, the majority of you that need to hear that message will never understand, and the rest of us decent humans living in civilized society will never understand how dumb you idiots actually are. If you followed me long enough, you've probably seen me engage with some haters. Because, hey, why not? I'd say 85% of the time, we at least end the conversation amicably, no matter how angry or how many expletives they call me at the beginning. Most people are just, like, not terrible. Occasionally, I run across some gems. One commenter's excuse was, this is the internet. Is this your first day on the internet? This is how people are on the internet. As if the internet isn't just a collection of information and people interacting with each other however they choose. Every comment you type on this video is the internet. You are currently shaping the internet. So make it what you want. You want it to continue being a cesspool of hate and idiocracy? Make that your legacy, I guess. Or you could just be not terrible. To the same degree, I've witnessed so many threads under my videos turn from cursing and hatred and name calling and belittling to a polite conversation just because one person offered the tiniest apology and acknowledgement that the other person is indeed another person. Most people are decent. Test it out for yourself. This comment section will be a great place to do so. So, hate The Last Jedi and hate me. My only advice would be, well, it's my channel's tagline. Liking things is more fun than not. And I'll take it a step further. Choosing to like things can also be more fun. 
As in, yeah, this movie happened. As of right now, Ray's parents are nobody, Snoke is nobody, and we could have been hyperspeed ramming ships for like, ever. I know some of you want this movie to not have happened, but it's in there now, man. It's, it's canon. I'm not the first to bring up that Empire received some scathing reviews when it was released in 1980, but I don't hear many people talking about why. And I think the main reason was that the trilogy was not complete. The same thing will happen with The Last Jedi. Once we've moved on to another trilogy, the kids watching these movies will immediately accept that astral projection, space flying, and telepathic conversations are canon force powers and part of the lore. As MatPat points it out, while theories may have created the fan response, someone watching this movie for the first time, even in say five years, won't have read any theories and won't be invested in the plot threads that don't actually occur. What happens, happens. 13 year old me didn't scream, what? Dark side force users don't have lightning power? I've never seen that before, when the Emperor zapped Luke in the last 10 minutes of the last film. I said, whoa, cool. And honestly, I was a little more enthusiastic when Luke force projected himself. Thank goodness not all the rules have been written. Though, I guess technically the, this one was in a Jedi book somewhere, so... But don't limit the force, why would you want to do that? How sad would it be if everything that could happen has already happened? So, yeah. I'm gonna defend this film, and I may seem a little annoyed at times because the hyperbole around this film is just plain out of control. Even in my own comments section, there are some repulsive takes. Every time someone even so much as requests The Last Jedi, there's at least a couple comments telling them how dumb they are. I'm not trying to give these people their 15 seconds so you can look for yourself. I've already said, no one can take the Luke of the original trilogy away from you. People change. This doesn't mean Luke was secretly like this all along. And I'm not trying to be dismissive. These are just some of the immediate thoughts that popped into my head when the outrage began. I don't think anyone foresaw how far the outrage would reach. Anyway, on to the movie. I want to start by saying that for me, this movie is a statement about our heroes. More accurately, how we perceive our heroes. The legend of Luke Skywalker. Outside of the countless books written about Luke between Return of the Jedi and this film, we only have the movies. If you look at those stories and the superhero status that Luke was elevated to in the years between, his current attitude is a direct statement against that. He's just a man. He got some really lucky breaks, was born into a powerful family, and everyone has been looking to him. Well, he said it best. I think what? I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down on the whole First Order? Both people in universe and out. We elevated him to mythical status. So of course he wants nothing to do with it. Who could live up to that? Who could write him to live up to that? And how could 67-year-old Mark Hamill live up to that? And I'm sorry, but Mark Hamill doesn't get to decide who or what Luke becomes. As much as I love his honesty and even his lack of ego for letting Ryan do what he thought was best, and side note, killing it in a role he fundamentally disagreed with, using the fact that Hamill was upset doesn't really mean much to me. And I'm not going to say that you misunderstood the original trilogy if you came away thinking Luke was the optimistic center of the universe. We all took our own truths away from those films. I think we can all agree that hope has been a main theme throughout Star Wars. Leia is always talking about it, it's Luke and the title of Episode 4, and now Rey and the Resistance are the physical embodiment of it. I think people were upset by who Luke became because he had lost his hope. But like I said in my Return of the Jedi video, even he was deceived in the end. Some of you disagree with my interpretation, but to me, Luke had to use the rage of the dark side to beat Darth Vader. He went up to and may have slightly crossed the line. The difference being that he turned back. But in that moment, he learned that the line between light and dark isn't as clear as it seemed. He tried to regain his hope one more time when he took Ben Solo in. And once again, chose a dark path for a split second, ironically seeing his robotic hand holding a lightsaber just like with his father. Only this time it was too late to turn back. The damage was done, this time he'd already swung that killing blow as far as Kylo was concerned. And you really can't blame that on this film. That's where we were headed after Force Awakens. I felt confident predicting it. Just like Master Ugwe says, one often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. He nailed the coffin closed on Ben's dark side allegiance in that moment. So at that point, he decided the use of the Force was not a good thing and he cut himself off. That's why he has no clue what's going on in the galaxy. Luke went into exile because he thought the Jedi weren't helping anything. Which, based on evidence and history, they weren't. It was a Sith who destroyed the Emperor while the last Jedi was being sizzled for sticking to the light side. I know that's an obtuse interpretation, but also very literal. Hope was no longer a luxury Luke could have, and I can't blame him for that. He failed his sister, failed his brother-in-law and best friend, and in failing his nephew had created the new Darth Vader. If that's not a reason to sideline yourself, what is? But that's just the first two acts of the movie. After a chat with Yoda and the realization that Rey didn't need to be a Jedi in the sense that he'd accepted, Luke found hope again. Watching her ask the dark side for help as he once did reminded him he didn't need to be afraid of the Force and he literally marches out to face the First Order with a lightsaber, knowing full well he's going to die. And by doing something so legendary, he sparks the hope that his physical form never could have done. 
He embodied that legend in a way that no one had before. I can't help but love that so much. I really feel like anyone who says Luke should have actually shown up wasn't paying attention. He had a way bigger impact as the legend than a physical being. He wouldn't have been able to do anything if he was really there. I guess the other option was Superman Luke? I just can't see a way in which Luke showing up and tearing Gorilla Walkers apart with his mind works in this film. Once you make him Super Jedi, where do you go from there? That's never what Star Wars has been about. Don't get me wrong, Vader's complete pwnage in that hallway is thrilling and I wouldn't trade it for anything, but that was less than what I've seen people expecting of Luke. Luke was never supposed to get God Mode. He's always been a conflicted kid trying to do the right thing, but often going about it the wrong way. In the end, Luke gave up everything to embrace his legend status in a wholly unique way. But enough about Luke. He's not even really one of the main characters, but I felt like I needed to explain why I liked his portrayal in this film. One of the main themes in this film is failure. Almost every plan put in place has at least a piece that fails. Poe destroys the Dreadnought, but every bomber is destroyed. Rose and Finn find a code breaker, but he ends up selling the Resistance out. Holdo sends the transports to the planet, but a lot of them are destroyed and she has to die to save them. But through failure, each character grows and changes. Initially, Rey can't convince Luke to come back, essentially embraces the dark side only to get no answers, and then falls into Snoke's trap to then be betrayed by Kylo one last time. But through all that, she was finally able to let go of her past. The thing holding her back, this ever-present who am I and where do I come from? Which brings me to one of the most hated versions. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. I don't see the you're nothing message as some inclusionist propaganda. Here's why. When the first Star Wars was released, Luke was the son of a long dead Jedi who some old guy spoke highly of. Far as he knew, his parents were nobodies, and soon even his adoptive aunt and uncle were dead. Luke was a nobody. Sure, he ended up being the son of the most powerful Jedi and Sith ever, but that's not where we started. Star Wars became a story of important bloodlines, but that's not what made us relate to Luke. He was just a moisture farmer who wanted to join the rebellion. I'm glad Rey is no one, because now we've circled back around to anyone can make a difference. The world has been opened back up. How can you hate that message? I've hit a lot of the main issues people had with the movie, but let's just knock a few out quick. I feel I need to offer rebuttals to the rest of them, not because my interpretation is the only correct one, but maybe to give those on the fence that feel swayed by the long list of issues some different options. Basically the same thing I did with the prequels. Spoiler alert, you're not dumb if these things didn't bother you, because a lot of them are nothing. Or really don't matter. We already talked about why Holdo didn't owe Poe an explanation. Just like in real life. Ask anyone in any branch of the military how Poe would have been treated for questioning a vice admiral the way he does. I get why it's annoying because it feels so convenient to the plot, but realistic and convenient are not mutually exclusive. And goodness you have to squint to turn this into an anti-patriarchy message. Haldo could have been a talking porg and the story would have played out the same. Another big issue people have is that the Canto Bite side quest not only is a waste of time, but actually makes things worse. First, that's the point, that's what this middle chapter is supposed to do, plus it was a learning moment for Poe about trusting leadership and Finn for realizing that there's more going on in the galaxy than just where's Rey. But more importantly, what annoys me is how some seem to completely ignore essentially the same thing happening in Empire. Leia, Han, Chewie, and 3PO go on their own save the world mission and get betrayed and captured, creating a situation where Luke has to abandon his training and then loses a hand. Bad plans failing badly has always been a huge part of Star Wars. The other big subversion was Snoke. I genuinely loved when Kylo followed through with ending him. That was a great twist, and I'm really thankful he's out of the way. Although there are still ways to use him, and if JJ is clever enough, he could still make him important. But he needs to sort out Kylo first. But without Kylo claiming his throne, I'd already seen this dynamic play out. I want something different. And I'm sorry, just because we live in the age of internet theorizing doesn't make the fact that characters' backstories aren't explored the filmmaker's problem. When Jedi ended and the Emperor was dead, how much did you know about him? Did it really matter, or was he just a foil? I'm not saying this film doesn't have problems without perfect solutions. It's hard to explain why we've never seen anyone hyperspace ram another ship before, even if there has to be a first time for everything. Though, like off the top of my head, they could develop some kind of shield that's based off a hyperspace engine that creates a wormhole that will just make a lightspeed ship pass right by you. Lightspeed weapons aren't the end all. Someone could also very easily explain that the stars aligned just right, the distances were just perfect, and she really just hit a one in a million target that probably can't be repeated with any consistency. I know I'm fixing a genuine problem, my point is just that it doesn't have to break Star Wars. Someone just needs to break it in the other direction. I'll admit that the slow speed chase leaves a little to be desired, and I feel like there were solutions the First Order just ignored, like... Send a destroyer ahead at light speed and then have them come back from the other side. But who knows, maybe it was just easier to wait them out. Why enter into a battle when you can just blow up a dead in the water ship? The intricacies of space travel and artificial gravity and every sci-fi part of this film have always been wonky. That's why it's fantasy, not sci-fi. 
What is the point of all this if we can't blow up three tiny cruisers? So it really doesn't bother me. It was just a framing device. And I think Hux is just arrogant enough to wait out the resistance anyway. What did he have to lose, really? They also could have made Holdo's reason for keeping the plan from Poe more apparent, and this could just have maybe been handled differently. Outside of a slow speed chase, I will say that the obsession with fuel being the catalyst for the story is weird. As if problems with ships have never come up before? I mean, it's a running gag that Han couldn't engage the hyperdrive when he needed to. R2 was always fixing shields. The Phantom Menace only ends up on Tatooine because of some part they needed. Fuel is just another component of space travel. It comes up in Rebels and refueling is mentioned in the main series. I'm really trying not to be dismissive here, but some of these complaints make it hard. The real point I want to convey is that if you want to start picking apart Star Wars and you want to not be hypocritical about it, you need to go back to the beginning. Start with fundamentals. Things like, why would the gunner for these bombers need to be anywhere near the actual turret? He's in a giant glass ball outside of the ship. In that same vein, they can't remotely control these ships that are about to be destroyed? Or like, since it's out of fuel, just let it float until it stops? The reason is that it's established Star Wars lore. Decisions were made early on to look cool over being practical. 90% of the shots made by the gunner on the bottom of the Falcon make absolutely no sense. The AT-ATs are like the dumbest version of tanks ever. They're on wobbly, way too tall legs, super slow, and their heads, where they shoot lasers from, barely move. They're vulnerable from every direction that isn't head on. This isn't meant to ruin Star Wars for you, my point is that none of this crap matters. I hate The Last Jedi because of tone and style and whatever else, but stop with the inconceivables. Lightsabers make no sense. In addition to defending Kelly Marie Tran, I have nice things to say about Ryan. But first, I can't defend this. You basically tattooed please at me on your forehead with that one, Ryan. I've never found much evidence to support it, but there seems to be a general consensus that Ryan and Disney were dismissive of fans who didn't like the film and wrote all complaints off as anti-feminism or anti-inclusion. That's no good if it's true. At the same time, Ryan's human and allowed to have emotional responses when people attack his work, and obviously once his cast of friends are being attacked, all bets are off. But everything I read and watched and listened to from Ryan shows me he really is a Star Wars fan who was trying to make the best movie he could to excite the fans. Maybe not please the fans, but he was trying to add to Star Wars rather than just rehash what we've already seen. So thank you for that, Ryan. And even though he was writer-director, you and I both know that every major decision had to be signed off on. And really, that's my biggest problem now that it's clear there was no plan from the beginning. To be fair, there was no plan for the original trilogy, and that turned out fine. But JJ and Disney knew they were making a trilogy and had an opportunity to at least outline story beats, and they didn't. Or Ryan threw them out. There's conflicting information on that. Maybe it's too hard to plan this out when you know a bunch of YouTubers are going to predict the whole thing. It's also interesting that everyone kind of glommed on to the bad guy's commission. Let the past die. Kill it, if you have to. Especially when he can't even do it himself. He thinks killing Daddy and Mommy and Uncle Lukey will do it, but that's not how that works. And the fact that he's so obsessed with killing the past, a la allowing the skim speeders approach by letting himself be tricked by his daddy's ship and then not noticing that Luke is a projection? Look, I give Luke a bunch of credit, but Kylo is an attuned force user that could have sensed what was going on if he could just calm the force down. But he's more obsessed with the past than anything else. And then let's look at the evidence. Rey keeps the Jedi texts, Luke embraces his own legend, even admits he was wrong about some stuff. Even the OG master comes back and teaches Luke some stuff about failure. Failure, most of all. The greatest teacher failure is. We are what they grow beyond. That is the true burden of all masters. That was supposed to be the takeaway, not the Sith, the Jedi, the Rebels, let it all die. Realize that failure is the best teacher, to learn from your mistakes and be better next time. Luke finally gets it. And Luke specifically wasn't killed if you have to. He chose how he went out and it was peaceful just like Yoda. Kylo wasn't even able to kill that piece of his past. But we do have to move forward. Letting the past die can be painful. But does anyone want Mark Hamill to carry every trilogy for the next 200 years? Do you think he wants to do that? Do you think he can? I'm going to stop asking rhetorical questions because I know that you don't want to see this trilogy play out the same way as the original trilogy. Of course you don't. But that's where we were headed. We don't need Kenobi, Skywalker, and Solo stories forever. It doesn't take a genius to see the Emperor, Luke, and Vader stand-ins. This story could have played out exactly the same. Instead, Ryan changed it. He subverted your expectations, just maybe not in the way you were <sighs> expecting. I don't know. The way people hate this movie makes me feel like I can't possibly be a real Star Wars fan. It's hard for me to understand because this is what I was expecting. Luke walked up to the dark side, took a step over to beat his dad, and then when the evilest bro in the universe yelled from the freaking far end of the dark side that he should join him, he was like, yeah, nah, I'm good. <laughs> good.
So yeah, Luke doesn't buy into his own status, his own legend. That makes narrative sense to me. And I'm sorry, but I'm thankful he wasn't super optimistic and chipper. He was never like that anyway. So I guess I still just don't get the problem. He starts out whiny, then he's sad for a bit. He has some fun with new friends. Then he's sad again. Then he's this. And this is the exact character that carried over to The Last Jedi for me. He's not just like back to normal after watching his dad die after he saved his life and then almost killing his nephew because of his adherence to the light, ironically. Dude goes into exile, wants to be left alone. That makes sense. I never thought I'd have to double down on some stuff I said in my prequels videos, but it is okay to like this movie. Some really intelligent people like this movie. You're not dumb, you're not not a real fan, nor are you just a fanboy. And there are also intelligent people who really dislike this film. Neither side is right, neither side is wrong. Well, I've been defending and talking so much about the themes, I've neglected so many of the little amazing details like the beautiful wide shots and lighting, the score, the performances. You can't even compare Hamill's performance in this film to the original trilogy because he's on another level. Adam Driver continues to carry us along and I really can't wait to see what they do with him next. He wanted to tear it all down, so he should be doing something completely different from Snoke or the Emperor or even the Jedi. I'm genuinely excited for Episode 9 because there's a story there and I really don't know what it's going to be. That's sort of exciting. There's barely much to theorize about. The slate is nearly clean. I don't know. I've been accused of being too optimistic. We'll see. Longest conclusion ever. If you made it this far, enough time has passed that I bet if you go back to look at the polls, you'll see that the you either hate it or you love it narrative is a little overblown. Just something to keep in mind. Next week, something way less divisive. Godspeed, Rebels. Salt. <laughs>